And we're live. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Yes, my guest. I've travelled a long way to meet my guest tonight. She's in <laughs> London, Fulham, London. A good friend of mine, Sandra Jordan. Welcome to the show, Sandra. Hi. Well done. Um, yeah, it's Photography Live and Uncut Thursday. Sorry, a little bit late. Had a little bit of a technical difficulty, but th these things happen. And delighted to be talking to Sandra, who I've only got to know over the last few months, in actual fact, because we're both members of the Arcanum. And as it turns out, we're in the same cohort with Jessica Lark, who's last week's guest. Uh, we'll talk about the Arcanum later because I think it's it's pretty important to us, actually, uh, the way that's <laughs> developing. But um, thank you for joining me. That's the main thing. Well, got a lot to talk, uh, it's a lot to talk about because your fine art photography is is fantastic. I really enjoy it. But I'd like to start off with what was the first camera that you can recollect in your household when you were a young lady, young girl? Um, well, I think when I was really young, I don't really have any recollections of, you know, the family having a camera. I mean, I, I know they did because I, I have albums of us when we were on holiday when I was kind of like yeah. 10, 11 years old. But I don't think either my mum or dad were particularly interested in taking photos. It was more kind of like snaps. So, yeah. uh, and my dad travelled a lot for business. So, you know, he, he wasn't kind of around that much. And my mum was um, like a housewife. So I don't think she ever kind of neither of them were really into photography so no. it wasn't till I was a lot later till about when I was about 17 right but, um I would say the first camera was the camera I bought actually into the house okay. and what so, was that one that was a Canon and I'd seen it in the local newspaper uh mm -hmm. for 50 pounds for a Canon film camera and two zoom lenses and I knew nothing about photography I just thought right. hmm, 50 pounds sounds like a bit of a bargain so I kind yeah, exactly. of drove down there and it was in a really battered old leather box kind of thing. And, and I just thought, uh -huh. oh, I'll, you know, I'll get it. And, you know, maybe I'll have a little play around. And as I said, I knew nothing. What, what was the reason for you buying a camera? Do you know, I don't know. Actually, I think I'm, I love to learn things. So even now as an adult, I'm always going on courses and classes and reading and stuff like that. And I think I'd come out of college um, and, you know, I was kind of like just, you know, bumming around a little bit. And I just wanted something to keep my mind active and wanted to get my teeth into something. Yeah. And, but I don't have any recollections of it, you know, being like something that I'd wanted to do for, for years and years. I think it was literally mm -hmm. just, I was looking through the paper and I thought, oh, that sounds like a great deal. And that was it. <laughs> so this is around about 17, 18 when you sort of yes. uh, yeah, really got your first camera. Yeah. Yeah. Just left uh, secondary school, as we would call it in the UK. Left yeah. secondary school in studying at college. And what were you studying at college? Uh, resitting my O levels. I didn't <laughs> do very well. <laughs> I think I was more distracted with other things at that age. So. Well, yeah, I must be honest. I think I was <laughs> distracted as well, and I I didn't do too well at O levels. There we go. Yeah, see, that's how old right? I am, isn't it? Going no, right it's, I'm not gonna, I wasn't going to ask that question. <laughs> I promise you. I promise you. Old is but the no, answer. I know, I know exactly. I know exactly what you mean. It, it, it turned out that I didn't. I was going to go to um, uh, to college, but then um, uh, I got an opportunity to uh, to meet uh, someone, and he said, "Why don't you come and work with me in the city?" So I ended up working in the city, and and I I did go for one interview at Goldsmiths College in New Cross because I was. I wanted to be a teacher. That's what I wanted to be. And uh, I wanted to teach PE. And and I uh, went along to this interview and the guy said, well, look, I'm sorry, Paul. He said, but you've, you've only got four. You need five. Uh, how times have changed. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I said, oh, yeah, I know that. So he said, so what are you going to do? So I said, well, I'm retaking my French O level. And he said, and what's your chances? So I said, well, I think I'm going to do pretty well. So he said, well, look, come back and see me if you get the fifth. If not, enjoy your new career. Because I just had this interview with this uh, broking company, money broking company. In London. Oh, yeah. I went, okay, fine. So I walked out and I told my mum and dad, I said, what do you reckon? She said, go and work in the city, you know, forget forget the teaching art, which is what I did. And I worked in the city for nearly 20 years. So, And there we go. That was That's my short history. And I, I like you, I, I, well, I should have gone to college, but I didn't. I wish I had done now, but there we go. It's funny because so, I think it has changed a lot now because actually I, I work yeah. in the film industry and we get people that have set, send their CVs in and they've been like four years in doing degrees and stuff. And yeah. It doesn't really make that much difference. That's not saying every industry, but, you know, I think I don't think I have done any worse by not going to university or not continuing to yeah. study kind of thing. So I think... It's interesting actually on the educational point of view how it seems to become in doctrine now that kids must 
get their O levels, their GCSEs, their A levels, then they go to university because that means they're going to get themselves a good job. And we know, as you uh, in this country, it's not that straightforward, is it? It's yeah. still a lot of hard work when you when you come out of university. Yeah. So uh, this is interesting because you mentioned already the career that you're in 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 films. Um, was that what you went into straight from college? No, I've actually had I've had quite a varied. Uh, work life I have to say so I, I I did college I did my O levels my A levels I then went to a secretarial college in right. Oxford my parents moved to Hong Kong at the time and they they asked if I wanted to go with them but I didn't want to leave my friends and so they said well you have to have some kind of educational grounding so we're going to send you to secretarial college um, and they didn't know that it was linked to an international college so I spent most of my time mixing with people from all around the yeah. world and stuff and that I think kind of inspired me to do a bit of traveling so after that, I went and lived in Austria for a couple of years. I worked and did the ski seasons for a couple of years. Fantastic. Came back, worked for the Prince's Trust for a couple of years, then went and lived in Turkey for a couple of years. Really? Uh, yeah, so I've actually, yeah, I, I would say I've, that's been more important to me than, go, you know, in the four yeah. years that I could have gone to university, I lived in Austria and I lived in Turkey. And, you know, that kind of set me up, up for life. Mm. So, yeah. Where, whereabouts in Turkey did you uh, stay? Uh, Kalkan down in the south i don't know if you know calcan i don't know calcan no obviously i've been to istanbul lucky enough to go oh. to istanbul uh, for okay. unbelievable unbelievable yeah. i went there with so much trepidation about the city for obvious reasons you know you're right on the the cusp of things there aren't you europe to the to the east yeah. middle east but i had a fantastic time people are so so nice over there aren't they i think turkey gets a really bad press actually it does indeed it. does and indeed istanbul is one of my favorite cities Oh, without a shadow. Uh, you know, there's so much to offer there for a photographer and for anyone, actually. But yeah, well, exactly. I mean, I could go and spend a month there easily. I think probably Istanbul was probably my first city where I did what I would term as real street photography because mm. uh, I remember going, walking over. Well, I, I got the, no, hold on a minute. I must have got the bus or walked over Galata Bridge where they're doing yeah, all the fishing. All the fishing. <laughs> walked around there and I'm still getting loads of the guys with all the fish that they caught and everything. And I'm walking back. I just, I don't know what got into me, but I just stopped and watched these fishermen. I said, oh, can I take your photograph? Yeah, sure. And, you know, I took the photographs. And I thought, you know, it it, it was it just changed my uh, opinion about the city completely because, as I say, I did have a lot of trepidation uh, going to Istanbul. Beautiful yeah, city. There's so much life there as well. Yeah. I think. And they're just fodder for photography, whether it's architecture or, mm. you know, street photography or, you know, and they are so friendly, Turkish people. They are. You know, yeah, I, I would, I would highly recommend it to anyone. Fantastic yes, me too. I, I would definitely, I would definitely go back there. Um, mm. it's, uh, it's one of those cities which you, 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 you just want to go back. It's, yeah. it's another city uh, that I've been to uh, is Delhi, New Delhi. I was lucky okay. enough to get out there on a, on a job. Didn't have a real good chance to to get around and walk around the city that much. But it's another city which I'd love to go back again. People so nice, so yeah. friendly, uh, and open. So let's get back to the photography oh, yeah. bit with the camera. That's what we're talking about, aren't we? Yes. So you, you got your Canon with your two zoom lenses, and, and what did you start taking? Just kind of like walking around the woods, and it, it was quite a short-lived, I have to say, it was quite a short-lived experience, uh, mm -hmm. photography at, at that stage. So it was literally sort of like landscapes and, you know, just around my local area. Um, and I probably only did it for about six months, to be honest, because then I went off to college. And you know, then there's boozing and and exactly socializing. Right. <laughs> Certain <laughs> things so, got in the way. Exactly. So so it was a long time uh, between that and when I picked it up again, which mm -hmm. was probably I think I was probably about twenty one, twenty two when I picked it up right, again. Okay. So around um, about four or five years. Yeah. Um, and that was because I'd had a back operation. I had, right. I slipped a disc when I was in Austria, so I had to have a disc removal, and I had six months off. Uh, and again, not much to do, wanted to keep myself busy. So I, I enrolled on a black and white developing course. Okay. And I, I, I loved it, that whole thing of going into a dark room and, yeah. you know, and not knowing, you know, not knowing what you've taken on your camera. Because I was very inexperienced as a photographer. Sure. Um, and then just seeing what kind of came out of it and the smell of the chemicals and everything. It's a, Isn't yeah, it strange? Because I, I, I remember this so well because uh, my first experience of, of, of uh, photography really was on a school trip to Monaco Grand Prix mm. where I didn't know this. We got in the van and off we go in the minibus. We're going down to mm. and I, I just said, well, what, what guy, what cameras you got, guys? 
and they got out their cannons and their pentaxes and the pratikas with all the, the zoom lenses and i had an instamatic 110 <laughs> and i thought oh crikey this is a bit weird and it was that particular trip which got me interested when we came back i bought myself a camera and started to go into the dark room now and then in in the uh, school but i didn't do enough because i was more interested in playing rugby and football but that chemical smell Mm. It, it stays with you doesn't it it's quite amazing it does and the red light like the glow of the yeah, red light like, right, yeah yeah, I, yeah. I, mean, I set up a dark room in the house that we were living in at the time in yeah. london so i had you know and it, yeah it's like you enter into a you kind of shut everything else out i think and that's, that's right, all yeah. you're concentrating on and that's yeah. the only thing that's important so it's quite a good way of like meditating kind of yeah, that, that's what cool. i find in yeah. photography these days that's why i love yeah. it so much that's but, a good yeah. point that whole and thing, as you're as you're moving the tray around and yeah. seeing that image appearing on the paper which is yeah. totally different now with our experiences of digital well, exactly. photography and your little stick with your little disc you're doing your dodgy yeah, exactly. stuff like that yeah yeah, yeah I didn't very... really get into that, that, that detail but no i didn't do that much in school because of the rugby pitch and the football yeah. was a bit of a bit more of a lure for me so to speak so so you had this period of four or five years where photography was nowhere then all of a sudden bang you're yeah. in, you've got this injury you're into photography now what camera did you change your camera gear no i still had the same camera right. and i would go out with my friends and take portraits of which i've still got i've still got all the negatives and all the photos it was many portraits i was taking right. um, and again that probably only lasted a year and then it went by the wayside again you know oh. life got busy yeah I, I don't know i didn't get the bug that i have now kind of thing yeah sure. like now i couldn't i couldn't imagine never take never doing photography again now it's completely sucked me in yeah it's interesting because i'm, I'm sort of similar to cyber story actually because for around I, I went through patches of taking photographs and i was very keen photographer up to around about 24 25 got married children come along then there's a bit of a you got taking your photographs there of your kids then the camera went away for a bit they didn't come out of the case you got so much gear mm. um remarried then more children and so on and so forth that that same pattern again until eventually the digital age hit, hit us around about the year 2000 and i had all this gear and i thought well, to hell with it just get rid of it and mm. switch to digital and it's those patterns and it wasn't really until the digital age started that photography really uh, I got the bug then. It, yeah. That's probably because at that age, I wasn't playing football, rugby or mm. cricket. And, and I, I'm, all I was doing really at the time was playing a lot of golf. So that's, it sort of went hand in hand really at that time. Yeah, so, I think life gets busy as well. You kind of get yeah, distracted and, yeah. you, know, you're, you know, and as a young girl, I mean, I was like 22 then, you know, yeah. then I was off to Turkey for a couple of years and, you know, then came back and I got into filming, uh, but on the production management yeah. side. Thing. and it you know it just it completely fell off my radar which i found quite bizarre now because i kind of eat sleep and breathe photography and i was going to say so you you get you got yourself into the film industry yes. <clears throat> tell us a little bit about that what what uh, what's your role in that industry so, so that i work i'm freelance which is great because it allows me my, my time off so i work as a production manager so in commercials okay. make tv commercials Okay. Um, and so I'll go in at the start once a job's been confirmed um, and I'll be given the script, the director's treatment and the budget. And basically my job is to make sure that everything is there on the shoot day and everything is organized beforehand to, you know, for a smooth shoot. So it's quite, it's quite varied. You know, I'm a head of, I, yeah. we have heads of department that I oversee. So you have like a costume department, location department, art department, makeup camera sure. department, lighting department. And so my, my kind of job is to oversee all them, give them all the information they need to bring whatever, you know, to the day, order the camera, the lights, the caterers, any permits and stuff like that. And then just make sure that, you know, we don't go over budget. So you have to do like budget control as well. And it's, you know, anything the director wants, you get. He, and, you he know, get, I have some weird gets. requests and you just, you know, and, you know, after it has led to some amazing things over the time. Yeah, you know, like I've dipped a Rover car in a vat of oil and put yeah. another car on the London Eye and been in woods in in Yorkshire at six o'clock in the morning. You were in, you were involved in that project, putting the car in the London Eye. Yes. Well, I'm blowed. Oh really? Yeah. Four nights it was up there, and we had to cover it up in the day so no one could see it. We had to take the engine out because it was too heavy to go in the pod, kind of thing. So yeah, I was. Well, there's there's, there's little. Just a little side tip, a good friend of my wife's 
her cousin is involved with BA that was involved with that. And I can't remember. She's a South African lady. Oh. Doesn't matter. But anyway, she, there well, was what? one thing because my son studied uh, events uh, at university and uh, he was, he had to put together an advertisement for uh, a car and they decided to do the Fiat 500 mm -hmm. and they were talking about it. And someone said, Oh, I'll tell you what, let's put it in the London eye. And he says, it's been done. Yeah. And, and, and there we go. That's interesting. That's a we'll, yeah. we'll talk about that after the show. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, so, um, are we getting close to the camera being yes. uh, back into into your life? Uh, 2000, 2007, so probably a good kind of like 14 years after. Yeah. Um, I had wanted to go back to see my friends in Turkey, and but I'm not the best flyer in the world. No. That's probably actually an understatement. I, you know, it kind of panics me. I hadn't flown for about six years. You know, the whole thought kind of terrified me. And my PA just, you know, I was talking about it, saying I wanted to go and see them, but I couldn't. And he just really casually said, oh, why don't you go by train? And I thought, that's a genius idea. That's I've never even idea, thought about that. that. An idea. So yeah. then I thought, okay, yeah, we'll go by train. And I'd planned this whole trip. And it was another just kind of casual, like, oh, I better get a camera, you know, because I'm doing mm. this amazing trip. So at least I want to document it kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I did a three-month trip that went through Germany, Slovenia, Croatia, Montenegro, Serbia, uh, wow. so Bulgaria, and then in, into Turkey. And I did it all by train there and back. Around right about that time, was there still the trouble in Serbia and uh, Croatia? Or did it all no. finish up? No, it stopped. No, I had it finished up, but I have to say that I did go with some trepidation, and that was yeah. only in my mind. You know, mm. it wasn't, you know, it's because I suppose we grew up with, with you know, knowing all the problems that they'd had. And yeah. I'm not an expert on that at all, but I mean, I, when I went there, I remember spending one evening going out thinking, I'm going to be kidnapped. I'm going to be, you know, the car's going to come along and, and, you know, that's it, I'm gone. And that was ridiculous because, of course, that yeah. wasn't going to happen. But it was no. my fear that I'd kind of, like, progressed in my mind. And it, it was an amazing place. I mean, I only went to Belgrade. but yeah. you know, And I wish that I was better at photography because I don't think I captured it at all. No, I, uh, Dubrovnik is is just stunning. Dubrovnik's just, lovely. Beautiful. Um, Zagreb beautiful. is beautiful. Yeah. Sofia, I was really in Bulgaria. I was really surprised, and I ended really? up at a Deep Purple concert, unbeknownst to me, in <laughs> open air. Are they but, still going? <laughs> well, this was years ago. So, but it wasn't the lead singer. It was like the no. big group, but not the lead singer. It was someone else. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was the only one dressed in not black and not long hair kind of thing. But it was fabulous. You know, the experiences you get when you travel yeah. you know, are incredible. And, you so know, that was a three-month trip? three month trip. That was a three -month trip. Um, and it was, I got to Istanbul and I booked a day with a photographer. And up until that time, I was still shooting on JPEG, still using automatic, not really you know, knowing anything kind of thing. And I met up with this photographer and he immediately switched me on to RAW. And you know, explained that and, and took yeah. me off automatic, and and it just became like an obsession. I don't know. It's just, it just you know, a I did it originally just to document my journey. But you then mm. you just start to see when you think with a photographer's mind, you just start to see all these beautiful things around you that you wouldn't That's normally right. notice. No, exactly. Um, and and he did. I don't like to be in kind of busy, touristy, crowded places kind of thing. And so I'd specifically asked to see you know, a side of Istanbul that tourists wouldn't see. Yes. Um, and, you know, he took me to neighbourhoods that were very, very local. And I got a beautiful portrait of a young kid wearing his mother's slippers and stuff. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, it was just, I was hooked from then on in. And I've become a just that moment. Got, Just it's, that moment. It, it, it's just that moment where you've had that little bit of tuition and don't, it's, it's hit you and, and you're Exactly. You're and, and you just need a little bit of tuition to just tweak you onto yeah. another level. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. then you're kind of set free to keep going and learning. And I think I think you made a good point there in actual fact because, uh, yeah, we all get the camera and the first thing nine times out of ten, everyone switches it to P, program. Some, <laughs> some people, Yeah, the professional <laughs> mode, exactly right, as they say. And But it's, it's knowing how the camera works hmm. properly, using manual or aperture or shutter priority, but using it properly hmm. and, and, and knowing what the camera can do, that then sparks the interest and then away you go. You're on another. Exactly. You're on another route, aren't you? It's yeah. uh, quite. Good. So, how long were you in Istanbul that particular time? Uh, I was probably there for about a week, um, yeah. and then I travelled down to the south to see my friends, and we went into the mountains. And so I did some beach photography. I did some, you know, mountain photography, and then we went into an area called Cappadocia. I don't know if you right. know that. It's right no, in the no, centre, no. 
another amazing place. It's all volcanic rock that has been carved by the wind and the rain over the years. So like little fairy right. chimneys and underground cities and stuff like that. It's an amazing place to take photos. Yeah. So there, and then the long journey back to England kind of thing. Okay, but, so you're back in England. And then do you, do you carry, get back into your, your film industry? Your, I do my filming, but I'm lucky yeah. that I only do it about four months a year. So I'm very okay. lucky that I don't have to do it all the time. And then yeah. I signed up on a couple of courses. And um, I think what the problem I had, and it was one of the reasons actually for joining the Arcanum, was when I went away, I'd photograph all the time. It would be an obsession. I'd be out for hours. But then yeah. I'd come home, not really that much. Wouldn't really do no. anything. Camera would go in the cupboard. It's one of the things, isn't it, living close to London? I'm, I'm just south of London, 30 minutes on the train. I'm in the city. If your thing is street photography, and um, architectural type photography perfect if you're into landscape photography or you want to look at something a little bit different that you like the travel type it's not really the best place to be is it because no. you've got to travel out quite a considerable way before you get to some what i would term decent landscape absolutely whether it's the south coast to, to uh, the jurassic uh, coast down in the devon sort of uh, cornwall area or or whether it's further north up to yorkshire to pick up the yorkshire dales that sort of thing so we've got a bit of traveling to do. So if you're, if you're close to the city, you're laughing if you're a street photographer. Yeah, exactly. And I understand oh, why oh. the camera goes in the bag, basically, on that front, because as we'll, we'll go to screen share shortly and have a look at your, your uh, website. Um, but before we do, I just want to quickly touch on the charity side uh, that you've, you've steadily been progressing through and, and offering these opportunities. How did that come about? Um, that came back, it was a couple of years ago, and I just felt that I wanted, I used to work for a charity, I used to work for the Prince's Trust, and yeah. you, know, you are working to better other people's lives, but what you get out of it yourself is actually incredible. And yeah. I just felt that, you know, whilst my life was great, job was great, photography was great, travel was great, there was something missing, and I just thought, photography is such a fantastic tool to be able mm. to put your voice through if you can't really speak about how you feel or you know it's a great way of almost hiding behind something to express how you feel and so I started doing some research on the internet and there's not a there weren't a lot of opportunities out there actually um, mm. and then I came across this company called Fairmail which is a Dutch company um, and they're not a charity they're a social enterprise so they work within communities and they sell products that they then the profit goes back into the communities and they were running this program in Varanasi in India and in Peru, where they have a group of 10 or so teenagers um, and they teach them photography. Um, and then they make greetings cards out of the photographs the kids make, sell them worldwide. And the kids get 50 percent of the profit to pay for their education or anything to do with their education. And 10 yeah. percent of it could be to improve their living, you know, their homes and stuff like that. And yeah. It was such an amazing program and, you know, the, the things that the kids got to do, not only build their own self-esteem and stuff, but also like one of them had raised enough money that he could build his home for his family. And another right. two had set up a bakery company with the money that they'd earned. And then, you know, they, so they were enabling these kids who came from very, very deprived lives uh -huh. to empower them to do something themselves. Um, and I thought about that and I followed them for quite a while because for Peru you had to speak Spanish, which I don't. And no. Varanasi I thought would be amazing, but I was convinced I'd be really ill. So no. I was kind of a bit nervous about going there. And, and then they just one day, again by chance, posted on Facebook just saying that they were thinking of opening up uh, a project in Morocco. Um, and I immediately contacted them. I'd been to Morocco on a trip the, the year before by train from oh. London again. Um, <laughs> and... Um, I just thought, yeah, no, that's something I could do. And I kept in touch with them. And they did this pilot project in Eswera on the coast. And I was the first uh, trainer. And what was great is that in the other programs, you know, they know how to do the photography in Peru and India. So it's really just taking photos. Whereas with these kids, they've never picked up a camera. So I was mm. right in at the start. Um, and we were there for seven weeks. And we had seven weeks to put on an exhibition. So from the moment they picked up a camera to an exhibition seven weeks later in, in, in one of the local houses kind of thing. And it was amazing. You know, we, we had lessons every week. They were loaned a camera so they could go off and, and practice. And, they, they, you know, they had to take responsibility for that. If they lost it, they'd have to pay it back. Um, and, you know, I, we taught them. You know, I didn't get too technical with them. 
but no. you know we taught them about color and composition and light and then we went out and did you know did loads of tests and we went out for walks on a sunday with the cameras and it was just incredible they did this exhibition at the end they came up with a project of how to show their life to the tourists and to the people and um you know one took photos of cats in the in the port and you know another one was kind of more social orientated and, and wanted to you know photograph the community and they did this exhibition at the end and they sold loads of photos and they ended up on moroccan tv and it was just such an amazing experience yeah, i was going to say that amazing experience not only for them but obviously for yourself oh i got so, so much out of it yeah i bet you did i bet you did let's uh, let's go to screen share uh, sandra and and um no doubt the um uh Clicked on the wrong link. Sorry, hold on. It won't be a second. I'll just go to screen share now. Um, let me do that. You should be. You've done this many times uh, with. Uh, yes, I have. You got. You got it now. Yes. And we're okay. I've got to click over to that. These are are your portfolios here. Your projects, which is lovely. But the one which I want to touch on here later on is the charitable work. Okay. Which is what uh, for my for my viewers. This is what Sandra's been talking about here. Um, and uh what i'd like to do uh sandra let's go to the projects is is there um a, a project here which is for the um charities there isn't is there no there is, is. There a, the project is, there a is purely my personal work In okay the charitable right. work there are a few links where you can see photos that the children have taken um okay and a bit about it says a little bit about the three i think um the, the link at the bottom is where it says click here. I think that is right at the bottom if, yeah, at the end. Uh, sorry, the last sentence. Got it. Let's just quickly see, because yeah, I haven't had a no, chance no, to do Yeah, no, no, because it's the thing that I'm most proud of, I think, that I've done in my photography life. They're the kids. Yeah, they're the kids, look at that. So, yeah. Digital, digital cameras, yes? All digital cameras, yes, all, all loaned okay. by Fairmail. Um, and these are all, I mean, you know, I do, I'd do. i love people to check this out uh, yeah, afterwards exactly. kind of thing because this all explains a little bit about them and what their hopes are. And I have to say they all came from such disadvantaged backgrounds. Yeah. You know, or orphans, lost their mum's dad, lost, you know, killed in a fishing accident. And right. not, you would never know. They turned up every week with smiles on their faces they were absolutely keen to you know amazing oh, amazing and you know what they didn't have much but yeah here are some photos of, of all sort of the work you know they're not they don't have the latest gadgets and you know all the things no. that we have in our kind of modern world but you, they were just they were so happy and keen and yeah enthusiastic it was well, just a total his, joy uh, this is jawed if you can see him with his i don't know i'm pointing at the screen the six photos <laughs> I mean, he was 14 yeah. years old, and at Lovely. the start, he was very, very shy. He lived in a, an orphanage uh, or a boy's home, and he was very, very shy. And actually, the manager said to us a couple of weeks in, they could already see him changing. He started having a voice and having conversations within the group. Because so, you found an interest that he's... Exactly. He's and you... And you look at, I'm just he's, looking at these six images here, and the one that's caught my eye is that silhouette of that cat, that shadow. And you know what? That was all him. I mean, it was just genius. unbelievable. He, took it. he he was amazing. I mean, he looks about eight in this photo, but he sure. he was fourteen. But he was amazing. Like he, you, you know, he'd take a photo, and I'd I'd go through the photos every week with him and say, look, this is great, but maybe next time think about this, think about this, and he'd be off retaking the photo again with you know, everything. I mean, he was a bright little button. And Superb. That shadow cat was just brilliant, and this is his well, one as well in the fountain in the in the waterfall. That's Jared's as well. I mean, he's got, you know, he's got a talent, hasn't he? He has. He's got a talent. And Monim's, if you think that none of them had even picked up a camera, and this is like, so that's seven weeks, but don't forget, they only had one lesson a week because they were yeah. at school six days a week. So it was remarkable, actually. Beautiful silhouette there. That sun. Uh, the, yeah, that was shameless. Or something like that. Superb. Yeah. And, and so they were all, you know, and this was Fatima, that's her, her grandma, but she didn't want to be seen. But, you know, that's a day in her life. Her grandma goes up to the roof of the house and hangs out the washing and, you know, that's that. normal life. Cl classic lead into the photograph yeah. using the washing line straight to the, uh, to the grandmother. Well taught. Brilliant. Exactly right.
I don't yeah. and the lead here down to the cat's yeah. eyes. And it, rather it, than squatting down and getting the cat yeah. full on. Yeah. Absolutely. It it, it was just cover. remarkable. I was so very proud of them actually. And just Super. the enthusiasm that they came. I don't know what that is at the bottom. What's that? Oh, that's, that's an ad. <laughs> Well, what, what I do uh, when I write my blog, Sandra, I'll, I'll put a definitely put a link to that for you. Oh um, yeah, that would because be um, that's amazing, isn't it? Uh, let's let's go back to your your site. And also, um, they do run. They're not in India anymore and Morocco because I think Morocco just did prove to be too difficult officially, yeah. kind of thing. But you know, they do want volunteers to go to Peru. Uh, you know, and, and, and they do holidays as well, which for a photography trip are amazingly cheap. And you mm. go into hidden places of Peru with the kids. So if you go, you've kind of paid for the kid to go as well. And I can only imagine that that would be an amazing experience as well. Yeah, it would be. It's, uh, it, it does. It, it... Well done to you for getting involved in that. Well oh, done. I loved it. Um, okay, so let's look at some of your work here. Um, hidden Beauty is my latest you can if you on the photo unless you want to go one by one but on the yeah when you see that little square it does show you yeah that. well um yeah this came out of okay. the arcanum actually um right it goes back to you know going on my travels and then putting my camera away at the end of the you know in the cupboard and, and never taking it out and one of the reasons for joining the arcanum was to get out and about in my own town because obviously exactly that's right. where i yeah. am you know most of the time mm. and um and I didn't really, you know, I started off and didn't, didn't really do much. And then I just started looking at all the architecture and yeah. I wanted to do it in more of a fine art way. And I, yes. you know, fine, what's been quite interesting is that whole brutalist architecture and that quite ugly architecture, which some would find I'm fascinated by. Yeah. I find it beautiful. Mm. And now I'm addicted. So now I go out much more than I did before. And yeah, this is the last project, the latest project I've done, which is, you know, ever evolving. I've still, you know, got loads of places to go. Yeah. And, um, it's made me find places in London that I didn't even know existed as well. It's a start. It's a trend at the moment, I find, because I've been fortunate to introduce, uh, interview uh, Julia Anna Gosparado. Oh, yeah. Wow. Ago. She's amazing. Um, she's amazing, isn't she? And she's obviously linked to Joel Chinchilla. Um, then I've spoken Another to Ren Kung as well. They're all yeah. amazing. And they're, they're all working on this great highlights, deep, dark shadows, concentrating on the highlight of the image. These are slightly different in yes. the sense that you're, you're prepared to, uh, to work with the background of the sky as well as the the architecture um and very um very balanced in their view mm -hmm. very symmetrical in their view uh yeah. which is different from what you see from as i say the trend of this uh fine art work by those uh, those guys that i mentioned well joel and juliana are so amazing at what they do they you are know, I, unbelievable. unless i could do better than them which i quite no. clearly can't there's no. no i don't want to mimic them so you know i want to do something that's more my own style and you know they oh, yeah. are just they they've nailed it in what they do yeah exactly right let's uh let's go back to um the projects again uh let's uh, let's uh click on silent beauty mm. this was um, um yeah this was uh i was lucky enough to be um, an expedition photographer up in yes. the Arctic last summer um, for a, a company called Hurtigruten, which is a Norwegian company. And mm -hmm. um, they do cruises to the Arctic and Antarctic expedition cruises. And this was two, did two tours around Svalbard, which is like halfway between Norway and the North Pole. I'm with you. And this is, uh, some of that is actually as far as you can get, as far as you can travel north. So it's all ice pack and next stop is the north pole so i mean that was a an amazing experience i mean one that i never could have imagined that i would have done actually no so, i was up in Norway two years ago uh, on a on a cruise and the weather up was fantastic it rained every single day of every single port that we stopped off at but it gave the mountain mountainous regions and all these fields a very sort of mythical uh sort of view to everything yeah um, I've seen very that. very green but uh but yeah, I, I, I'm not a massive fan of bright sunny days and stuff. No, I exactly much right. prefer cloud and grey yeah. and moody and you know I, I'll leave all the nice sunny travel photos to the photographers that are so brilliant at them. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, I'm definitely. Where come from. Yeah. You, you've got to have a bit of cloud in the sky, haven't you, for uh, like this one on cue? Thank you very much. <laughs> 
super work, super work. Let's go back to the uh, projects again. Uh, the glacial is. Would this be? Uh, is this Iceland? Uh, this is again Svalbard. So it was at the same time. Um, right, okay. And you know, this is more about. I mean, I. It's funny. I went originally because I desperately wanted to see a polar bear. Um, yeah. And I did. I was lucky. I saw twenty-three polar bears, which was incredible. Um, but I became, and I didn't kind of realise how beautiful the ice was and all the glaciers and stuff. That's right. And I think yeah. that's what I came back with having been enamoured with the most. I mean, the whole area is stunning. All the landscape's beautiful. Yeah. But the glaciers, they really stuck with me. Just everything, they have their own personalities. Everyone is just different and, and yeah, just really years of history way. and yeah. held within them. Truly amazing. What sort of equipment are we using here now, Sandra? Uh, I'm still on the Canon system. Um, right. I, I, when I bought digital, I stuck with Canon because I kind of naively thought that I just, I've got two lenses, I might as well just, you know, stay with Canon. And of course, I very quickly realized that I was going to buy all new lenses. Um, but I've got a, a 5D Mark II and then more recently a 6D as well because I needed two cameras for that expedition. Um, yeah. And mainly all Canon lenses. My main lens walkabout is a 24 to 105, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great lens. And then I have a 17 to 40. I have a, just bought last year a 70 to 300, which is quite a big beast. I wouldn't, you know, it's not really for walking around London with, um, but I no. needed it again for the wildlife up there. And then a couple of Nikon lenses I've got, and I've got a, a Samyang 14 mil because I try and do um, the Aurora, the Northern Lights photography when I go up yep. to Norway in the winter. So I have that. Um, and that's my main. And then I also have a Fuji X-E1, which I know you have as well. Um, yeah. But I haven't got on so well with that, I have to say. It's not, that's gone back in the cupboard and has been mm. with a Sony RX100 3, which yeah, is okay. a tiny little thing. And that's my in my bag the whole time. But, you know, it does make good, great photos. But is that is that the, that's is that the full frame Sony version? No. Oh, oh, no, it's not. No, 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 it's is not full frame. I don't think. I so. don't know that much about this. The only only Sony's that I'm hearing a lot about now, obviously, is the uh, the A7s. Yeah, no, it's oh. not. I don't think it's full frame. But it, it you know, it's a twenty megapixel camera. It does, you know, you're on manual. It's got loads of options, which I, yeah. you know, I have yet to explore. I haven't even looked at the manual actually, and I've had it about yeah. five months. Yeah. But, um, you know, the cannon's too heavy to just walk around with every day, you know, if you're going to work and stuff. So I think this is the thing which a lot of people are finding now with the DSLRs, the Nikons and the Canons, is especially mm. uh, the weight weight of them. Um, the the people that I'm talking to now are sort of saying, well, yes, I want a lighter camera. The only thing I would say with the Sony setup, with the A7, I think their lenses outweigh the basic, the lightness of all the camera, so it's putting more weight back into right. it. So um, I, I can't see the advantage of that, apart from the fact they are full frame. I think the body is fantastic, but I just don't like the lens stable, which is being created uh, mm. through the Sony range for the moment. Um, but uh, no, I can understand why a lot of people uh, look to move away from uh, from the, we'll come out of the screen share, fantastic images there, uh, Sandra. Um, of, not, of, a, of a selection, it's not just one down one alley, so to speak. Uh, it covers a, a wide selection of, of view. Um, no, talking about the DSLRs, I think this is the main issue now. A lot of people are saying is the weight, carrying mm. around uh, two bodies, <clears throat> three, maybe four lenses, depending oh. on uh, what they're looking to. And, and, and a lot of people are saying, no, I can't do it. Street yeah. photography, I can't imagine myself walking around the street as I used to with a DSLR, with a 28 to 85 zoom lens, and uh, to do the sort of interest that I have in street photography now. Um, I think yeah. it, more people are aware of you if you're walking around. When I was in Morocco, yes. if I had my Canon camera, you know, they would immediately think I was a professional photographer. Exactly and, right. you know, it was going to end up in a magazine or on a postcard or something. If you have a smaller camera, you can get away with it, not more. Not that I would take images of someone secretively. I, I would always, no, no. unless it was a, a vast street screen where you can't really make anyone out, but I'd always want permission because I don't want to invade yeah. in, their, in their kind of privacy. But... It does make it easier if you've got a smaller camera. It's an interesting point you make there, actually, because uh, during the summer I was down at Brighton on a, on a walkabout. Uh, well, it's a workshop stroke walkabout. And I'd 
prior to the uh, event, I'd gone down onto the pier right the way along where they got all the the uh, the parade at the far end there with all the uh, new amusement arcade that, oh, that yeah. sort of thing. And I had my X one hundred S taking photographs, no problem at all. Not single person came up and approached me. There's no problem at all. I wasn't taking any photographs of the children or anything of that nature to, mm. to even cause any problem. But later on in the in the workshop, one of the guys said he'd gone down there and he had a Nikon D7000 with a with a quite a big zoom lens on it. And he said he was stopped. And oh, really? Said, yeah. Can you uh, get off the pier, please? Um, this is a this is private property. You're not so, supposed to be taking any photographs. So uh, that that's basically what you're saying that the, yeah the inconspicuousness of a, of a smaller camera um i switched out of fuji mainly because I, I i just i felt the nikon were going nowhere with their gear um mm. i didn't want to have dslrs anymore and they weren't bringing on any smaller camera which was going to be sort of like a one and a half crop which would uh, which would suit my style and i just got uh got the idea of the the fuji xe1 it is it's a it's a strange little camera actually because I've had no problem with it at all, uh, but others have said no. It doesn't work like I'm used to. Um, and funny enough, I was talking to a friend yesterday. We were walking around London. I think that when you make the decision to switch from a from a DSLR to a mirrorless camera, you've got to stop using the DSLR because yeah. you're continually going to compare the behaviour and and the way. Well, it doesn't yeah. focus as quick as my DSLR. Well, no, it doesn't. But there are some other advantages. There are, yeah, with, with exactly. The, with that. But uh, I think if I was doing a trip, I'd always take my Canon. Yes, exactly. Uh, right. I, I love the feel of it. I love, yeah. you know, it, it, the way, I mean, I do love the weight of it and I, I, you know, I do love it, but you know, I just, you know, it's just not, I mean, I'll come back with a terrible back every day if I was like yes, that around all the time. That's another thing. Cause in my line of business now with the, uh, the exhibition business, I normally get one or two days free to walk around the city and it's, and it's Dusseldorf or it's, if I'm lucky, Paris, Berlin, those sort of places oh, where I'm doing street or a bit of architectural type work and lugging around two, sometimes three camera bodies, which just because I've taken it, which is the ridiculous thing, three or four lenses in the rucksack. I just thought I can't, can't keep doing this is ridiculous. Mm. Um, that's what makes it unenjoyable though, doesn't it? It, it does. In, sure. in the end, yeah. And you still want photography to be something that's enjoyable and then you get pleasure yeah, exactly. out of. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you, I, I don't know this. This is straight off the bat. Do you, apart from your work that you've done with the charities, with obviously you've you've done some tuition there. Do you, have you done any other type of uh, workshops in in the UK? Maybe as in taken part or as in led. As in led. Um, no, the only ones I've done were on the ship up around Svalbard. Part of part of my job was to run a, a workshop or uh, to run a seminar. So it okay. would be a seminar on photography, and then. I mean, I'm not great with m big groups of people. I, I would much rather have like one or two people. So mm -hmm. I did the introductory seminar, you know, how to make better photos. And it, it, again, it was it was not that technical because, you know, some people had DSLRs, some people had mirrorless, some people on their iPad, some on their phone, uh, you know, kind of yeah, so it had exactly. to appeal to everyone. But then what we did do is we'd go out and, you know, I'd talk to them one on one and, and teach that way. I think that's much more my style kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it's something that I'm going to look at in the future. In fact, as one of my levels in the Arcana, actually, it is something that yeah, exactly, I'm looking yeah. at. Um, one of the reasons I asked yeah, you. Yeah, not, not at the moment, but there is something brewing, shall we say. But it's, nice you know, one. it's just, you know, the starts in my head at the moment. But I love to teach. And I think, you know, I think it's, it's something, you know, I've got friends who, are, who I think would really benefit from just getting out. It's a meditate. I think I said it to you before. It's meditating yeah. for me. It's one way of blocking everything out, mm. and you know. And I think I use that as much as I do to get an end product, as it were, kind of thing. It's mu it's as much about taking the image. Yeah, it is about I th I th what you see. from my from my aspect because it's getting close to basically a situation where I think maybe uh, the business that I'm I'm working in is is probably going to close down because the boss is getting close to his retirement age, which it makes me in a situation where I've got to start looking to mm. do something else to bring in some income uh to to the house got to put the, the bread on the table so to speak and it is workshops which definitely interest me but i think also what i'm i'm looking at now is considering setting up workshops with seminars which yeah. i think is a nice leading because 
at the end of the day, I find the workshops that are working well at the moment, as you've seen in, in my uh, yeah. in my comments, we're getting around to the Arcanum now as as, uh, as we're talking. But I think that the feeling that I get is that to do a successful workshop, not, not necessarily you have to be a great photographer because I'm still of this belief that just because you're great at photography doesn't mean to say you're going to be a great teacher. True. Um, I think there's too many other examples of that to, to say that, you know, that's not the case. So I was thinking along the lines that I think that when my workshops do start, I'm going to bring in some qualified photographers to create the seminar within that workshop. That's a great which I idea. Think would, uh, I think which would add value for money yeah. to, to the event. So uh, that neatly brings us round to our love of the Arcanum. Yes. Um, so uh, when did you first start? I think I started like last September. Um, All right. I, 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 I sort of part applied in, in June, and at the time there really wasn't that much out on the internet about it. You know, no. I, I tend to, I'm a real organiser, and before I step into anything, I want to know everything about it kind of thing. And I just couldn't find any information. And no. I, I sort of arrogantly, I suppose, thought maybe it's too junior for me maybe it's a beginner's course and you know i'm not the most technical photographer in the world i'll put my hands up you know to that but i thought yeah. mm, i'm not sure if i'm going to learn anything out of it so I, I didn't do anything for about three months and then i thought oh just you know let's just sign up what's the worst thing that can happen they give you sure. a month you do a month and then if you don't like it leave you know you're not contracted so I, mm. I put my application in and I just thought, oh, I'm really busy at work at the moment, but, you know, it'll take months to get picked. So, you know, I, maybe I'll be picked in kind of January or something. And um, the lovely Glenn guy from Australia kind of picked yeah. me within two days and I just thought, oh, gosh, I'm so yeah. not ready to do this. Um, and, you know, I went in and it was so different from what I expected. I don't mm. think I ever thought it would lead to what it has led to, as in the people I've met, the friends that I've made, what yeah. I've learned, the community that, you know, comes from it, the mentors that you get to, you know, be tutored under, you know, it, it's been an amazing experience. And I, I can't think of any other course I've done. I've done a few online courses that has delivered so much for essentially a, a, a small fee because, yeah. you know, you're getting a lot, you know, you, the more, and also if you put into it as well, like you have the opportunity of critiquing other people's work and, and helping other people as well. And you get loads out of that yourself. So for watching a video of someone else's critiques, there's always takeaways for you in it. Exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah no. I was, I, I was, I, I don't know. This is interesting. You say you didn't know much about it because I, I used to watch Trey Ratcliffe's um, program where you used to have four or five guys on and they do, this was before uh, uh, the, the creation uh, mm. series. Uh, I think he called it Trey's Hour or something like that, Trey Reckless Hour. And I remember him saying, I've got an important announcement to make and that go to my stacking customer, there was a link. And I saw this art kind of thing and he said, imagine that you can do this and imagine you can do that and all these these arcs going across the earth. And I'm thinking, this is this is Trey Reckless far-fetched here. This yeah. is, he's, he's thinking out of, on another planet. And then it could apply for interest. And I thought, well, in for a penny, in for a pound, because mm. I've never had been on any workshops at all until that that day. And I put my name down and I filled in the form. Uh, and that must have been around about, do you know, I reckon that was about January or February of last year. Okay. It's about and it was a real, real, nothing was going on. And there was all this, just wait, just wait. We're getting things together. And then I was talking to Michael Rommel, a good friend of mine, and he had applied as well. And he said, what group do you want to be in? And I said, well, if there's one fella that I would really like to be involved with, and that's Frederick Fran Johnson. Mm. He said, why? So I said, well, I'm interested in the social media side of yeah. things and how you can develop on from that. And he seems to be the guy that in that list of guys, uh, of potential masters, he seems to be the one that I think I would be interested in. And he said, well, what about someone else? So I said, well, I don't know. I, I really don't know. So he said, well, jokingly, he said, if you see me going, OMG, 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 oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Mm. He said, you'll know that I've been picked. Well, we put the phones down, and I got a text on my iPad from Valerie Jardin. Oh, yeah. Do you want to join the Arcanum? I just couldn't believe it. So I immediately texted him, OMG, OMG, yeah. OMG, and he replied back. And he said, I've just had – we have been picked the same time to be in Valerie's street, oh, wow. street cohort. 
so that's how i got started um and followed it through and i've said this many many times and i do mean this most sincerely i learned more in five weeks five days of being with the arcanum than i did in five years of being a member of a camera club yeah because as you say the most important aspect of it all is not necessarily the time that you get with your master which let's face it is one every five levels mm -hmm. uh, on a one-to-one -one, but you get the input from your fellow apprentices which is so important and they and you get all things. their knowledge as well exactly right you get all you their know? knowledge that they've had for years and years and years kind of thing exactly like, you know my whilst i didn't think i was a beginner on the photography front my post production was not that yep. great you know very limited kind of thing and the the amount i've learned i mean i i use lightroom you know about 95 percent of the time and i you know even the little kind of tricks and stuff that i didn't know about the amount i've learned mm -hmm. there i ingest it so much easier than if i was reading a book kind of yes thing, kind of thing. and it's just yeah you just and you get to me i mean the people are fabulous i've yeah. made some really good friends i i hope yeah. to see you know hope to actually meet up with a couple of them um mm. and yeah the whole experience to me uh, you know glenn was amazing and put so much in to the course yeah. and everything uh, now we're both in jessica's who Joe and jessica's uh cohort, yeah. it, was, it was it was a it was a strange transition for me really because yeah we all ended up in lounge 20 and we were all wondering what the next stage was i think we caught dare i use the term the hierarchy out a little bit because everyone sort of blasted through foundation and sphere one so quickly they were with a number of guys there but of course what it was was instead of having 100 200 300 odd people with five or six genres you probably had 40 or 50 guys in in that lounge which were basically covered by about two genres and and yeah. and one or two were street photographers and one or two were were something else so it was a difficult thing which they had to get sorted out and i remember curtis simmons saying to me he said uh, what do you get first do you get your taxi drivers first or do you get your customers yeah. and that really summed it up because I was, and this is no secret, I was starting to lose a little bit of uh, interest and patience with it. Uh, but gladly it turned around and Jessica came up with this idea of creating this this cohort with uh, a cross section yeah. to develop on the business. Well, she, I mean, I have to say, that I think with anything that's new, um, and, you know, I know the Arcana has been going, you know, over a year and stuff, you know, it, it's always teething problems. You know, so, you know, the first ones through are always going to be the ones that kind of bear the brunt of, of things i think and then you learn from that and then you know the people that follow up have a smoother ride i mean i was lucky i was only in the level 20 for about two or three weeks maximum I yes think. yeah but yeah and i and i have to say again when jessica picked me i kind of naively thought well you know she does this amazing kind of like boudoir photography and and finance stuff but how does that really relate to me it kind that's of that's exactly what stuff. i thought um and and then we had, you know, she invited us all separately for a kind of a one-on-one. -on -one. And yeah. I think within 10 minutes of speaking to her, I thought, yeah, you're the one for me, without a doubt. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, and I'm, I'm so impressed by her. And I just think, you know, we just had a hangout the other day. And, you know, she's, I've gone in yet again another direction. The architecture came from Glenn. That was kind of that transition mm -hmm. through something that he just casually kind of mentioned from work that he'd seen. And again, you know, Jessica's taking me in a direction that I didn't even think that I was going to go or even thought about kind of thing. So yeah, it's, it has been a remarkable experience for me. I've loved it. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with you. It's, uh, it's certainly, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying there. And, and, and really from the, uh, the experience of this, this sphere as well, with the yeah. amount of work, when you, when you see the amount of work that the master, <clears throat> and it's not just Jessica, it's the other guys as well, the amount of work they actually put in to create mm. To create the the levels and to create the, the the feeling of the cohort and everything that that's what counts for me when you when you see that yeah and of course as you say the the, the pièce de résistance really the cream on the on the cake is the uh, is the great friendships that you yeah get together you know people in Australia and people on the west coast which we would never have met exactly you know, exactly. Time. Yeah. And also, I mean, I did one of Trey's um, photo walks in London. You know, oh, you were on that one, yeah. yeah. And, you know, people I've met through there as well that, you know, yeah. we've stayed in touch and I met up with one of the guys and stuff like that. And that, you know, the energy in that walk was incredible. There was about 200 of us. I know. I, I saw the photographs. Unfortunately, oh, I couldn't make it. I was full intention of going. But I, I do remember uh, someone saying, uh, how many do you reckon will be there? And I was talking to them and I said, probably between 150 and 200 people. 
I think it was like 220 or then, you know, all following Trey around kind of yeah, thing. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. But it worked, you know, it worked very well. And, and yeah. you know, I got to talk to him and he's just lovely, I have to say. Yes, yeah. Uh, you know, very, nice comes across guy. very, very straight and down to earth, isn't he? Really, yeah, really, really nice guy. And, you yeah. know, and I said, I've kept in touch with a couple of guys on that as well. So, you know, if anyone's watching and Trey's doing a photo walk somewhere near you, I'd definitely go. Yeah, definitely go. Got yeah. to get on board. So we come to the point of the show where a, a, a lot of my guests balk at this question. <laughs> I think I'm going to, too. Who's your favourite photographer? Oh, I don't, can I say favourite? One person that, you know, when I get, I do get asked this a bit, and the one photographer that I come back to time and time again is a, a, a gentleman called Joseph Hofflehner, or Josef Hofflehner, who's yeah. um, an Austrian photographer. Yeah. And um, I first came across him, he did the Jetliner series, which were the airplanes, the black and white shots of the airplanes flying really low. I, don't, it, I think it's Martinique, I'm not sure which island it was. And you have all the okay. people on the beach and then the planes come down. Uh, and I was lucky enough to see his exhibition in, in Paris, actually. And, you know, they were stunning in, in real life. And I would say if I could be anyone, it would be him. His style, I can recognize immediately. He does um, black and whites and muted color, or subtle yeah. color, I think they'd call it. And, you know, I, I see, I, you know, I follow him on Facebook and stuff like that, and I'll see an image and I immediately know it's his. And he yes. just has, you know, they're quite, they're, they're you know, quite solitude, empty. I mean, they've still got a lot of things in them, but they're very peaceful and, yeah, yeah the style is amazing. So I, I would say, He's right up there, but there are, you know, there are a lot of photographers. There's loads, there. I know. Sebastian it, Salgado, amazing. I, I know. It, there's, there's someone that isn't mentioned very often, in actual fact, when I, when I asked this question. Obviously, the, the big, big favourites are your Cartier Bressons and your Ansel Adams. Yeah. They go without saying. And um, uh, Joseph uh, Kudelka, and I've got Brassai, I've got books of them behind me here. Yeah. They're the ones that normally come up because they're the old classic photographers. Uh, but uh, I, I do know of Joseph Hofliner. Oh, his, his work is amazing. And then there are yeah. people like um, Camille Seaman, who's an American photographer. She's done a lot of yeah. Arctic photography. Um, you know, she's, I think the theme through all of them, there's another uh, guy, Vincent Mounier, who I, I think right. is French. A lot of them are Arctic photographers as well. And again, it's the same thing. I mean, there's another guy called Caleb Kane Marcus, who did a whole portrait of ice. Book, which is beautiful I, I love collecting photography books yeah uh, and the similarity between all of them I would say is they're very peaceful they're uncluttered yeah. and beautiful photography and then you've got someone like there's a guy called Matthias Heinrich I think Heiderich I think it is his name who does architecture and okay. um and that's all in very kind of candy colored turquoises and pinks and yellows and stuff oh, okay. like that. he's German and, and his work's remarkable as well so yeah. I'm not sure I could say a favourite. I like a lot. No, I, well, I think you, you, your favourite is Joseph Huffman. My favourite is, Huffman yeah. Because, was... because he comes to mind straight away. When people ask me that question, I say soul lighter straight away. Mm. Um, because I just love the, 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 the colour tones. I love the, the one thing about soul lighter's work, which I find so intriguing, is the layer of work that he's done, the layers. Yeah. You've got the a, a, a aspect in the front, then you've got a middle, and then you've got a back. And it, in actual fact, makes me think about this rule of thirds, mm -hmm. where everyone thinks that the, the, it's all split into thirds. But then I ask the question, how about thirds? Exactly yeah. right. Three, three layers within the photograph. Yeah. And, and, I just, and I just think about that. And he's the one that I immediately think of. But then, of course, as I've just mentioned, Katia Bresson, Brassai, yeah. Kudelka, and Salgado, Ansel Adams. The list is enormous. Yes. And we haven't even talked about the young up and coming youngsters that we know karen hutton trey ratcliffe oh Thomas i mean Cotard. that's the thing there's the too many amazing photographers. too many to, exactly that's right problem, you know just well not the problem it's great but i mean that's oh, yeah, no, it's not a kind of pinpoint no it, it, the only problem we've got is that we haven't got a bookcase big enough to hold all these books yeah, that they produce my, that's the only yeah, my bookcase is getting a bit mine's have to be re-strengthened over christmas because <laughs> I, I do know I, I sneaked into Santa Claus's uh, little cabinet, and I do know one book that I've got coming, which is the the uh, Cartier Bresson. Oh, really? Um, talking about yeah, the one with the the butterflies on the front, the Matisse uh, oh, I too. Yeah. I can't wait to open that up. Um, so, who's inspired you then? Who's been your inspiration? Now, this doesn't have to be a photographer. This could be your mum. 
can it be an object as well? Because I'm not yeah, sure whether. Be, yeah, what? I mean, I was thinking about that. Who you know, if if you're thinking about who, if you're thinking about who inspires me as a person, I would say my grandma, without a doubt, who who actually isn't right. anymore, but you know, full of life, and you know, at 80 years old was you know doing the shopping for the old people, and you know, nice. all things like that. But if you're talking about photography, um, I think I I get my inspiration kind of from bits everywhere. So, you know, okay. it might be, you know, a shadow of a tree on a brick wall that the sun has made, or it might be an angle of something, or, you know, I do look at a lot of photography books and a lot of photographers, and I'm sure subconsciously my inspiration yes. comes from them, without a doubt. I don't think exactly that would be right. the same yeah. for anyone. Um, but everything else is more about, I don't know, I'll walk around and I'll get a gut reaction. And I either like something or I don't. There's no, there's no lukewarm with me. And I guess that's my inspiration. So I'll see like a building that looks great in a certain light and that's what I'm inspired to go and recreate somewhere else, yeah. I think. Yeah. So I think rather than people, it's probably things that I come across. Interesting. And an interesting point you made there, you don't get sucked in then on something that appears to be popular at this time, mm. even if you don't like it. Mm, no, not really. I think you know the the one thing is, is that I've always stuck with is like always. It's it comes from my gut. It's just like a if I you know I will see a scene and I'll either absolutely love it or it'll be like hmm. Mm, mm, so I yeah. won't I won't take it. And yeah, you know I'm sure subconsciously it, it speaks volumes about who I am as a person and you know the things that I'm drawn to. But like, you know, when I put a photo on a computer, I'll look at it and I'll be like, oh my God, I love that. Or, you know, yeah. Great. There's yeah. A, a, you know, there's, I won't try and make a mm, image, you know, amazing. It's, yes. it, it just, you know, sticks on the computer. So yeah, I don't think I'm really led by what's fashionable. I don't think, no, I'd say that I, I kind of, so. no. But then, you know, I, I, my photography is for me, really. It's yeah. lovely that people like it and, you know, it's even better when they buy it. That's an amazing mm. compliment. But I, I do it for myself. You know, I don't. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's what art's all about, really. You do it yeah. for yourself. And if you are fortunate that someone picks it up and says, yeah, I'd like to have that on my wall. Exactly. Then, then please uh, pay the pounds. You know, it's lovely. Lovely experience. Sandra, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Great talking it. to you. Thank you. Fan fantastic uh, experiences that you've had, especially with your charity work. Uh, yeah. Oh, and uh, that, that's amazing. And uh, as I've said uh, in the show, I'll, I'll be putting all the links, uh, not only to your website, but your Facebook and Twitter and, and uh, the charitable link there so that people Beautiful. can check out. And, and hopefully uh, they'll, they'll be interested as well and they'll, they'll sign up to, to join the party that's uh, going out there next time. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Um, yeah, it would be good. Are you are you due to go out there again for another? another um, well, Morocco time? is 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 not happening again. I'm quite tempted to go and join the Peru trip. I think, right. um, yeah, I think, but they will be different children. They're not the children. I mean, I'm still in touch with my Morocco kids. Yeah. The beauty of Facebook and, and social media and stuff, it's quite easy to say. Uh -huh. If they did one in Morocco with those children, I'd be there like a shot without a doubt because I know them. They're kind of yeah. like, you know, they're like my children. I'm like a proud little mum kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I think from the experience that I got with that, if you get half of that experience in a trip going through to unknown places in Peru with local teenagers and just see learning more about them and stuff, it will be a trip that you'll never forget. It will yeah, be amazing. Yeah. So, Thank yeah. you, Sandra. Really enjoyed talking to you oh, this evening. Thank, Thank you so much. very much. We've had a couple of live viewers watching as well, which is absolutely superb. Oh, great. It's, it says two on here, but that normally means there's been about 10, which is okay. nice. So uh, that's super. I'll be posting it all up for everyone and uh, make sure it's running up on YouTube later on. So uh, thank you. Thank you for joining me. And, and for the viewers that have been live, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Just to suffice to say, as I do my sign off, if you're going out shooting this weekend, leave your camera bag at home. All the best to you. Bye for now.